You're listening to the Just Japan podcast. Everything you want to know about Japan. Well, hello everyone. It is your host Kevin O'Shea here with the Just Japan podcast, episode number twenty. Japan and the World Cup, and I want to stop you for taking the time to stop by, download the Just Japan podcast, and listen to it. It's because of the fact that people like you are listening to the podcast that it grows and gets stronger and stronger each and every week. So, again, my name is Kevin, and I am the host of the Just Japan podcast. Every week, I bring to you a different topic about Japan, some aspect of living in Japan, Japanese culture, Japanese history, media in Japan. And this week, it happens to be about Japan and the World Cup, and of course, that is because right now, as we record episode number twenty of the Just Japan podcast, we are smack dab in the middle of World Cup 2014, which is taking place in Brazil. Now,、um, when you when you listen to this, maybe some of the information might be a little bit dated with regards to the specific matches, but I think if you're interested in Japan at all, you're definitely going to be interested in the topic. This evening, and、um, of course, the interview we have.、Um, so, as of now, Japan has lost Game One of the World Cup. They lost their their Game One. They lost to the Ivory Coast, <clears throat> and、um, coming up、uh, soon will be their match against Greece. And well, who knows what's going to happen after that? Who knows? Well, he's who knows what's going to even happen with that match. But we do talk about it this week on the Just Japan podcast, and I've got a very interesting ge-、uh, guest. Um, Liam Kerrigan, and he is someone who agreed to stop by and talk about football, soccer. He knows a lot about the topic. He now lives in Japan. He's from Scotland, and has a lot of experience working as a freelance writer、um, for a variety of different publications in Scotland and the UK, writing about soccer, writing about football. He also hosts a podcast about soccer. So、um, definitely someone. Um, who who knows a lot about the topic, and it was great to have him on to talk about the World Cup. Because I mean, I'll be honest, guys, I'm a fair weather fan. I wouldn't even call myself a fair weather fan. I am <clears throat> one of those people who becomes a soccer fan once every four years during the World Cup. And I am Canadian, and Canada hasn't been in the World Cup since 1986. So obviously, I'm not supporting Canada. And I am here in Japan. I have a Japanese wife. My my children are half Japanese. So you probably can assume that I am. Indeed, supporting Team Japan. So again, I want to thank all of you for taking the time to listen and download,、uh, listen to and download the Just Japan podcast. Remember, you can support the Just Japan podcast over on Patreon.com. The link is in the show notes at BusanKevin.com. Go to BusanKevin.com and look for episode number twenty and check out the show notes. The link's there. Okay. I also want to thank you for for downloading the show. Remember, you can listen to the Just Japan podcast by subscribing on iTunes. And remember, if you do, if you do use iTunes to listen to the Just Japan podcast, I would really appreciate it if you could take the time to stop by and leave、um, a review and also give us a rating. That really helps us in the iTunes world.、Um, it helps the show pop up more.、Um, it helps us draw more attention to the show and and hopefully get more people listening. Now, if you don't like iTunes, you can of course listen to us on Stitcher Radio.、Um, just do a search on Stitcher, and you'll find us.、Um, Stitcher has a free app which you can use on your、uh, iOS device or your Android device. So there you go. You can also, if you don't like either of those methods, you can、um, listen in the、uh, Libsyn web browser. Libsyn is the podcast hosting service that I use、um, for the Just Japan podcast, and of course, all those links are in the show notes. At busankevin dot com, so go check it out. Now, as I've already mentioned, it, we are smack dab in the middle of the World Cup season, and to be honest, I don't know very much about soccer or football, as many people call it. Here in Japan, it's called soccer. So, and I'm a Canadian, we call it soccer. So, for that sake, I will. Uh, refer to it as soccer,、um, but、uh, again, since I don't know a lot about the topic, I like I said, I'm I'm the kind of person who becomes, and there's a lot like me.、Um, I become a soccer fan once every four years during the World Cup.、Um, I brought on someone who does know a lot about soccer, not just the World Cup itself, but knows a lot about soccer in Japan and a lot about the Japanese、uh, squad. And we talk about that. We also talk a lot about the J League, which is the 
um, competitive professional league here in Japan itself. So sit back and take a listen to my interview with Liam, a guy who knows a lot about soccer in Japan. Um, so everyone, I just want to thank you for stopping by and listening to the interview portion of episode 20 of the Just Japan podcast, Japan and the World Cup. And uh, this evening we have a very special guest um, who's who, who knows a heck of a lot more about football or soccer, depending on which nation you're from, than I do. And uh, that's that's... That's the reason why I've asked him to come and talk to us tonight, because he he knows a lot about the topic, and it's currently World Cup, I wouldn't even say it's World Cup season, the World Cup's happening right now. Um, so uh, our guest tonight uh, is going to talk to us about uh, the World Cup, about football in general, and all that kind of thing. So um, I'm, I'm happy to introduce uh, Liam. So uh, Liam, can you uh, tell us a little bit about yourself, and um, you know where you're from, and, and what you do, and where you live in Japan? Sure. Um, so, hi everyone. Uh, I'm Liam. I'm originally from Scotland. Um, I've lived in Japan for almost six years. Um, I spent a couple of years in Hong Kong as well. Um, and uh, I actually used to be a football reporter at one point in the past. Um, I'm now an English teacher working in Osaka City. Um, but uh, I still do a little bit of writing here and there, um, mostly on football. And uh, yeah, I've been a lifelong fan of a, a little team called Celtic that um, fans in the UK may know, um, Scotland's biggest club. And um, yeah, I've I've loved football ever since I was a very small child. And it's been a real pleasure that I've been lucky enough to write about it and observe a lot of it over the years. Oh, wonderful, wonderful. So, okay, so you, you've, you've been, now I, I'm a Canadian and uh, w- one of the really interesting things is now in 2014, um, believe it or not, and, and maybe someone like you would believe this, um, there are more children registered in youth soccer, and I'm going to use the term soccer because I'm a Canadian. I'll try to use football, but it's kind of like hardwired in my brain, soccer. Um, mm. There are more children now registered in youth soccer in Canada than youth hockey, um, which um, for, for many Canadians, they might find that hard to believe. But yeah, there's a lot more kids actually playing soccer in Canada than hockey. Um, but when I was growing up, um, I, I never had exposure to soccer and I never had the good fortune to even have an opportunity to really play it. I grew up in a very small town and we had a little league baseball league. So in the summer, basically your only option, you, you, if you wanted to play sports, you could play baseball. And uh, once it got too cold for baseball, kids played hockey. And that was really the only two options where I grew up. Um so I um, mean, for 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 people, and uh, you don't have to go into this too in depth. For you're from Scotland, I'm from Canada. For those who are from maybe for America, Canada, North America, listening, um, and I I hate to kind of sound a bit of like a, a North American bumpkin when I ask you this question, but um, how, how big is soccer, it's football? Well, um, in in Scotland, I would say that um, for many people, it's it's like a religion. It's, okay. you know, a lot of people, if, if, I mean, if you're Christian, you go to pray in the church on a Sunday. If you're Muslim, you go to your mosque. If you're Jewish, you go to your synagogue. If you're in Scotland, you go to the stadium. <laughs> and mm. um, it's um, it's been like that for pretty much for most of the last 120 years or so. Um, football in Scotland is mostly based around um, what was uh, a rivalry between two two of the biggest clubs, um, Celtic and Rangers. And this wasn't just a sporting rivalry, this was also a social and cultural rivalry as well. Um, traditionally, Rangers were representative of the largely Protestant establishment in Scotland, and Celtic were representative of the immigrant minorities. Um, and the irony is it's now gone full circle because a couple of years ago, Rangers went out of business and ceased to exist, whereas uh, Celtic are now the dominant force. Um, and it's um, it's kind of interesting now. The dynamic in Scottish football has really changed the last couple of years um, because now you've gone from what was essentially a two-team league before to now a one-team league. But um, Scottish football is a lot more diverse than that. There's actually, um, I think, around 40 senior clubs, um, which... Considering Scotland only has a population of four point nine million, that's an incredible number. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, um, I mean, so I mean, when you make that comparison, when you when you throw out that term religion, that's mm-hmm. exactly what so many people in Canada throw out about hockey. 
Um, you know, they talk about like, you know, yeah, exactly. You know, um, those who are fans of like the original team, you know, the big teams like the Toronto Maple Leafs or the, uh, Montreal Canadians. It's that's, that's for so many Canadians, what, what, uh, what hockey is a religion now. So, so you, you mentioned that you are, um, or you, you know, you are currently still, um, but in the past, I know you, you did a lot of, um, of writing for soccer, uh, writing about football, um, can you maybe tell us a little bit about your background with, with, with being a writer, a sports writer? Sure. Um, I, I was very lucky that um, I actually um, actually left school when I was 16. Um, I was one of those people that, although I got good grades, school didn't really work for me, you know, and I wanted to pursue my own thing. And so I was fortunate enough to be hired as like the, what, what you call the copy boy, like a sort of office assistant okay. at, um, at the Herald in Glasgow, which is... Um, Scotland's premier uh, broadsheet newspaper okay. and um, I worked there for a year as an, an assistant and I was given a couple of assignments I got to go and cover a couple of lower league games and um, my first article actually was actually about the the Shaolin monks of China who did a tour of Scotland with their kung fu class and that was an amazing story to cover um, but anyway I digress um, <laughs> I am um, uh, following on from that, I went to journalism college and I did two years at college. While I was studying journalism at college, I was still writing for the Herald as um, a reporter on the minor leagues um, okay. and the reserve, the under-21 league, which is like the youth team leagues in Scotland. Um, I was in charge of that. Uh, later on, I went on to do some more sort of senior match reporting and um, I actually got to interview... Um, a gentleman by the name of Hugh Dallas, who was at the time Scotland's top referee. And he later, a couple of years later, in 2002, he was actually the assistant referee at the World Cup final in Yokohama. Oh, wow. Okay. I've, I've got fond memories of that World Cup, actually. I was in Korea uh, during World Cup 2002. Mm. And uh, damn, that was like the best time of my life. Actually, I went to five matches. Mm. Um in Korea, traveled all around the country, which isn't that difficult because Korea is pretty small. But uh, wow, oh, cool, cool, cool. But I'm gonna probably rant about that on, uh, uh, later on, or mm -hmm. I, I wouldn't say rant, but share some stories. Mm -hmm. um, but so, so it, it is. Um, as as we're doing this interview, it is um, um, we're we're coming up uh, towards the end of the first week of of World Cup 2014 in Brazil. Yeah. Um, I just finished. So, I mean, you know, I'll let everyone, this is a Wednesday evening here in Japan. Um, I just finished watching some highlights of the Brazil, Mexico game, uh, where they tied one, one, uh, well, no, wait, did they tie one, one, uh, no, zero, no, zero, no, no. nil, nil. Right. Um, and I know Korea and Russia tied one, one mm -hmm. and, uh, one of the score from today, which is eluding me, but nonetheless, we're in the midst of it. Um, now, Japan had its first match, didn't do so well. Um, yeah, so they played the 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 Ivory Coast, Cote d'Ivoire, yeah. and uh, they really came out and smashed things up in the first half, and then uh, never seemed to come out of the locker room after halftime. Well, in body they did, but uh, but uh, but yeah, so so they they ended up losing the first match. So now again. Um, I, I'm just kind of watching the World Cup as it goes on and watching the kind of the pundits and the commentary as it goes on, but I haven't really been following much up leading up to it. So mm. how how would for the people out there who are really into Japan and um, curious about what, what's going on with Japan, how would you say Japan stacks up against the other countries competing? Well, Japan's group, actually, the group of four in which Japan are playing is a fascinating group because – I was looking at it before the tournament and I thought realistically any of those four teams could win that group. They're all very kind of evenly matched. Um, mm. You've got Colombia who are kind of a middle of the road South American team. You know, they're a decent team but they're not on the same level as Brazil or Argentina, you know. Mm. Um, then you've got Greece who were European champions back in 2004 but they've not really done anything since then. Um, and they're a good sort of workman-like team who can produce the occasional shock. And you've got Ivory Coast, who are, I think, probably physically the most powerful team in the tournament. Mm. Every one of their players looks like a heavyweight boxer, you know. No, that that is so true. I noticed that. I noticed that right away. I mean, one of the things when you look at a lot of the, uh, again, here I am speaking as someone who doesn't know anything about anything. But what, what I'm just observing as a layman, um, when I see a lot of the uh, the top soccer players or the football players, you know, you see a lot of big, powerful legs. 
Mm. Um, but you don't see very big upper body. You see very lean upper bodies, you know, not, mm. but, but the, the Ivory Coast players, I noticed that they're very bold. They almost look like sprinters that kind of like the really bulky muscular upper bodies. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Th- th- that's to do with their, with their coaching, I believe, because, um, their, their style of football is, I mean, I would say in the second half, I mean, it was not, a, it was, it wasn't a dirty game, but I think physically they, they bullied Japan and they, they kind of beat Japan into submission because Japan were just physically too small. Mm. Um, and that's why, although Japan lost that first game, I believe, and <laughs> I'm sticking my neck out here, but I believe Japan will beat Greece Okay. Um, in the next game for the simple reason that the only difference between Ivory Coast and Japan was that physical advantage. Okay. And that's not going to be a factor against Greece. Greece are not a particularly big team, not a particularly physical team. And I think Japan have the edge in terms of pace and skill and overall ability. Mm. Um, and I'm kind of torn because actually one of my favourite players, Giorgio Samaras, who used to play for Celtic, actually plays for Greece now. And um, okay. for him, I want him to do well, but Japan is my country now, so I want Japan to win you know, as many games as they can. So I'll be rooting for Japan, but I'm going gonna, gonna to feel sad when Greece get knocked out, you know? Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um... Well, I mean, I'm in the same situation. A lot of people say to me, they're like, Kevin, what, who are you rooting for? I'm like, well, obviously not Canada. <laughs> um, I think, gosh, and I, I hmm, when was the last – Canada – the last time Canada was in the World Cup, I believe, and I, I don't know the it year. Was 86, I believe. It is, when it, it was in Mexico? Yeah, your one and only appearance was 86, I believe. 1986. It was a one and only – oh, yeah. Which, which, And that's a fascinating thing that kind of boggles my mind. They say that now in Canada, we're a country of about 35 million. Mm. There are more children playing youth soccer than youth hockey in Canada. Yet, what's going on? Um, I suppose, yeah, it's, it's, it's interesting. I mean, it, it makes sense why more kids are playing soccer. Um, it just, I mean, hockey is a bloody expensive sport to have your children involved in. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, it's, it's interesting. And I, and I don't know the answer cause I don't know much about, about soccer, but, um, we, we, we just aren't producing, I don't know. I don't know what's going on there. Any, any ideas? Well, the thing is, um, <laughs> as I digress the, from Japan to talking about Canada, the, the difference is that, um, Generally, you find that countries, particularly with football, countries tend to dominate once football really takes hold in the culture. Mm. Now, although youth involvement in football is increasing exponentially in Canada, at the moment, Canada is still, by and large, a hockey country and, to a lesser extent, a baseball country. Yes, very true. So those are always going to be the dominant sports. That's always going to be the sports that everybody wants to play. Mm. Um, yeah, I, I'll tell you a little, a little anecdote. Um, years and years ago, I was fortunate enough to hear um, some stories from a, a Japan player by the name of Shunsuke Nakamura, who um, who used to play for Celtic and was was at the time probably Japan's greatest player. Um, he's still playing for Yokohama at the moment. Um, but he's, okay. he's 35 years old now. He's on the way out, but he's a great player. And anyway, he he told the story that um, he someone asked him, "Why did you become a?" Uh, a soccer player, as they say, and he said, um, "Because I wasn't good enough for the baseball team." Ah, uh, well, in Japan, that's so true, huh? So, had he been a slightly better pitcher, Shunsuke Nakamura may never have become a professional football player. Oh, that's so that's so true. Yeah, yeah. In Japan, it's yeah. really. I mean, I and I've never seen it. I've. I mean, I've never seen anything like it. Um, the the altar of baseball. Mm. I mean, what it is in Japan, especially like youth baseball. Um, it's, uh, it's more, it's like fanaticism. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, you, you see the kids at school, they're there at six o'clock in the morning for practice and they're still playing at six o'clock at night. You know? Yeah, yeah, exactly. And even during the holidays. And I mean, yeah. um, you know, if, if, if you ever, for those out there who are listening, if you're interested in coming to Japan and you ever have the opportunity to work like maybe in a public middle school, um, you know, you might even, for example, on a holiday, something like Obon, which is like the, uh, the uh, the August holiday where it's kind of a a, a, a time for people where people take time off to you know, pay reverence to the dead and visit their ancestors' graves. Um, you know, schools are closed during that period of time, and there's no students there in theory. But um, I can remember last year. I, I can remember going there, and it was like bloody forty degrees, forty three degrees heat with the humidity, and the baseball team would show up at eight o'clock in the morning, and they would practice until long after hours after I had left for the day 
Um, yeah. Um, yeah, but it's yeah, life for them, I believe it really is. So, I mean, I, I suppose, yeah, if you weren't good enough to make the hockey team, maybe you, I guess in Canada, maybe you play on the baseball team or mm-hmm. you choose another sport. If you weren't good enough to not, not, not play on the hockey team, but play at a top level. Yeah. Um, and go, go back to my, go back to my original point. That's the problem is that until you get to a stage where football is the kid's number one priority, mm-hmm. as it is in countries like Brazil, like England, like Germany, like Spain, you're never going to be at that top level. And that's why even though the USA won their first game the other day, which I think was a great achievement, they're still very much mediocre in terms of world football mm. because it still hasn't taken hold. The women's game has gone astronomically high in, in America. And the US, although Japan are the current world women's champions, I think that the US probably are regarded as the best all-round women's soccer team. Yeah. yeah. Um, and that's because, again, the perception it's seen as more of a girl sport in America. Oh, yeah, that's true. That's true. Um, I mean, they even make jokes. They talk about like soccer moms or girls yeah. soccer mom dropping the girls off at, you know, the they don't don't mess with the soccer mom. You know, they're yeah. brutal. Um, but I, I, I suppose in America you've got football then baseball. Um, yeah. and, and I mean, when I say football, I mean American football. Yeah. In that term of 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 order sports, and I guess you know the point you're making too. When I think about it as a Canadian. Um, Maybe a lot of the kids who are top, who are really good soccer players, they probably are actually hockey players, and they're just very athletic kids who play soccer in the summer to keep in shape. Yeah, exactly. For a hockey season, yeah. Um, okay, well, so so um, so for those who are okay, World Cups World Cups on right now. Uh, we're in the mix of it. Um, for those who are, are interested in Team Japan but maybe don't know a lot, who are who are some players maybe they should be watching for? Well, um, at the moment, the, um, the, like the, the established stars of, of the Japan team, um, there's Keisuke Honda, who is mm. our, sort of the main goal threat uh, playmaker, uh, plays for AC Milan in Italy, um, very accomplished player. He played in, in, uh, in Russia, in uh, Moscow before that as well, so he knows the European game very well. Very much a European-style player, although he's Japanese. Um, Great skill, very quick feet. Scored a beautiful goal the other day. Oh, that was yeah, that was beautiful, wasn't yeah. it? Yeah. And then also backing him up, you've got Shinji Kagawa um, of Manchester United, um, who again spent a bit of time in Germany before he went to um, before he went to Man United. And I've always kind of rooted for Shinji because he's an Osaka boy as well. He used to play for Cerezo. So ah, uh, okay. Um. So yeah, he's he's a very good player, but um. The interesting thing is that in, in the Japan team, he's deployed in a very different role to the way he's deployed at Man United. Man United play him all, almost as like a, a, a winger or like a, a, a midfielder, whereas in Japan, he's almost like a second striker behind Honda. Oh, okay. Um, so he definitely has a much, he's got much more license to come forward and attack in, in the Japan team. And I think Japan's style is very open and very aggressive in that sense. It's great to watch, even when Japan don't win. They're very rarely a boring team, you know? Mm. Um, and in terms of um, going a bit further back, in, in the defence, you've got Nagatomo, who plays for uh, Inter Milan in Italy. Okay. Um, very accomplished fullback, very good crosser of a ball, very ex- excellent positional sense, just your, your, your typical all-round classy European defender. Um, and uh, very, very, very skillful player, and he's got a real good um, eye for a pass as well. He's, he thinks nothing of spraying 40, 50, 60 yard passes. You know, he really knows how to how to play the game well. Um, nice. And I would say one to watch for the future is um, a young man by the name of Yoichiro Kakatani, okay, who currently plays for Cerezo Osaka. Um, I'm a little bit biased in that sense because Cerezo is my Japanese team, but um. <laughs> um, Kakatani has all the tricks. He's got all the skills. Strikes a beautiful free kick. Got a powerful shot on him. Can dribble. He can shoot. He can turn very quickly. He's got brilliant pace. Um, he's very much like um, like a younger Shunsuke Nakamura. He reminds me of Nakamura when he first came to Celtic all those years ago. Okay. Um, and he's still only young. I think he's only twenty two or twenty three years old. You know. I think he could be the next big Japanese to make a move to Europe, possibly after the World Cup. Oh, okay. Oh, cool, cool. So there you go, folks. Um, those are those are people to definitely look out for. Um, so okay. Um, 
Now, one thing I was thinking about when, when you know, I was putting together some questions to ask you about football in general in Japan and this and that. Um, now, one thing I've noticed over the years uh, that I've been in Japan, I've been in Japan, I think, probably about as long as you. I've been here for about six years. Um, and, you know, I, what, what I've noticed since I've been here, now, mind you, uh, and I have to admit this, embarrassingly so, I have yet to attend a professional sports match in Japan. I have not been to a Hanshin Tigers baseball game. I haven't been to a Vissel Kobe game. Um, um, I had I had actually tickets to a Vissel Kobe game um, two weeks ago, but then my son got a really high fever and I couldn't go because um, we were going to go with the family. Um, what, what, one of the things that happens when you've got little kids. But um, you know what? What I've noticed when I've gone, for example, I've been to some live shows, some different concerts and things in Japan. And I've noticed that, for example, like when a band is like rocking it out and they're playing hardcore and if it was like a, a Scottish audience or a Canadian audience, the, the, the crowd would be just going wild. But yet in Japan, they're very subdued and they almost just kind of stand there in a very kind of uncomfortable, awkward way. Um, now, I don't know if it's always like this. Maybe it's not. Um, but what, how would you describe um, Japanese football fans? Well... Um, Compared to other, yeah, they they have every bit as much passion and energy for the game as um, as European fans do. Um, okay, you know I yeah. I've been I was lucky enough to go to a game a few years ago now, but it was um, FC Tokyo against uh, Jeff United Chiba. Okay, and this was this was in the in the arena in Tokyo, and um, the uh, the crowd must have been about maybe. It, I mean, the stadium was only about half full, maybe about 35, 40,000 people. Because um, I think the stadium's capacity is probably about 70 or 80,000. Okay. Um, but the noise they made was fantastic. I mean, it was only a small group of fans. You have like your hardcore fans and the other ones who make all the noise. They start all the songs. Yeah. Um, quite a lot of their songs are borrowed from, from English and uh, other European teams. Um, they do a fantastic rendition of You'll Never Walk Alone, which is actually a song Celtic fans sing. Oh, yeah, yeah, I've heard of that. Um, and um, it was really interesting because um, the day that I went there, actually, that particular day, I think they, they do this once a year. Um, the J-League had a promotion. It was British Football Fan Day. Okay. So on that day, if you showed a UK passport, you would get in for 500 yen. Oh, really? Okay. Um, so me and about 20 of my friends went to this game. I mean, I'm going back about six or seven years here, but we, we went to this game and um, it was great atmosphere. I think it ended up 6-2 to, to FC Tokyo. Um, really entertaining football. The fans were amazing. The, the singing, the dancing, the, the, the all the music they brought as well. You know, they had their own musical instruments and they were banging the drums and... Interesting difference, though, is that, um, that there's a lot of beer consumed. Okay. And in Scotland, for various reasons, uh, consumption of alcohol in the seating areas of stadiums is not allowed. Well, I think there's probably a good reason for that, though. Yeah, well, there was a riot about 30 years ago, and it's been banned ever since. Um, yeah. But, um, yeah, it's uh, it's interesting the idea to actually sit and have a beer at the game, because that's just something you can't do in Scotland, you know? Oh, really? Oh, wow. Though That's definitely something you can do in Canada. I mean, now, things don't always turn out well with that. We had an incident... Um, uh, for example, I mean, hockey, you've always been out with some beer, but uh, the Vancouver Riots mm. um, a few years ago after the uh, the NHL, the Stanley Cup playoffs or championship, Vancouver lost, and um, that was pretty pretty damn ugly. Everyone always paints pictures of Canadians being, uh, you know, we're just a good people, eh? And we never <laughs> cause any trouble, eh? Because we're Canadians and we like everyone, eh? But, um, you know, there's a lot of people who certainly didn't like uh, civil order, during, during that time of, uh, you know, looting stores, yeah. you know, setting cars on fire, beating the crap out of people. But, um, but yeah, yeah I mean, I, I, you know, the thing is, I, I mean, you know, as well as I do, I think with Japanese society and the way Japanese people are with kind of following, I don't know, how should I say rules, societal norms, although they do drink and they enjoy that, they, they would never get out of control. Uh, the, the social conventions here are just totally different. Mm, um, absolutely. Yeah. The idea of getting drunk and going crazy is something that, you you know, you, in, in, in Canada or in Scotland, it's dismissed as, you know, youthful exuberance, whereas in Japan, that would be severely frowned upon, you know? Well, I mean, this is a country where they actually have, uh, although they're not 
you know, they're not ubiquitous by any means. Um, you know, there's vending machines where you can buy cans of beer, you can buy yeah. alcohol, and I mean, and there's no like ID system for them. No. Like anyone could just throw in some coins and buy alcohol. Are they abused? No. No. Do people break them open and steal all the alcohol? No. Do people put chains on them and drive away, dragging them behind their truck? No. No. But they would in Canada. Yeah, and they would in <laughs> Scotland too. Yeah. Um, but the other interesting thing, I just look at a different facet of the, of the of the Japanese football fan is mm. that um, I guess it's the same in Canada with your with your hockey and your and your baseball. But um, in in Scotland, we we follow a team. Oh, know? absolutely, yeah, yeah. So I'm a Celtic fan. My mm. family are all Celtic fans. Um, you know, other guys are brought up to support Rangers or Hibs mm. or Hearts or Dundee United or Aberdeen. You know, you, you're brought up and you're taught. That's your team. That's who you support. Doesn't matter who's playing for them. Um, whereas in Japan, there's a lot of fans. Now there are people who support teams, obviously, but a lot of fans who follow players. Oh, okay. So they'll they'll move from team to team with a player. Yeah. Like when I was when I first moved to Tokyo, um, I, had, I had a friend who was a who was a Beckham fan. Okay. And so when I first met her, she had the Manchester United shirt on, and she was, oh yeah, you know, love love Beckham, love Manchester. Six months later, he moved to Real Madrid. She goes and gets the Real Madrid shirt, you know, and um, and then actually a few years later, she actually moved to Los Angeles. She uh, got a Galaxy shirt, and yeah, she follows Galaxy to this day. <laughs> oh really? Oh. Yeah. Oh, good for her. <laughs> yeah. Oh wow. Oh. So I should have a Toronto FC kit. Um, no, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, I mean, I suppose the same, the same thing. Well, no, actually, that doesn't happen. I think Canada's more is more like uh, like would be in Scotland. Um you're a Boston Bruins fan, or you're a Edmonton Oilers fan. You follow the team. Um, you know, or or heaven forbid you live in a small area where people only go for a couple of teams and you follow one that's outside of the norm. Um, you know, I I I uh I grew up in a very small town where none of us really had any access to any of the teams aside from watching them on TV. Um, mm. but uh, Eastern Canada, we have the you know the original six teams of the NHL. A lot of people went for those. Most of the people uh, I grew up with either liked the Montreal Canadiens, the Boston Bruins, or um, uh, the Toronto Maple Leafs. And I happen to really love the Pittsburgh Penguins simply because I was a fan of the uh, Mira Lemieux, the great hockey player. Mira you know, it's I, funny, actually. I used to follow the Pittsburgh Penguins for a while as well. Okay. Well, so I loved I loved <laughs> the Pittsburgh Penguins because I loved Mira Lemieux and there was a guy named Paul Coffey. Um, yeah. And I actually, my nickname, no joke, um, <laughs> through by a lot of people in my town, a lot of the guys my age and older, um, all the way through junior high school and high school, they called me Penguin. <laughs> Because I was the only guy. Yeah. So, like, hey, Penguin, what's up? Hey, Penguin, <laughs> how'd they do last night, Penguin? So <laughs> I just they just called me Penguin. <laughs> but what are you going to do? Um, yeah. Could have been worse, right? Yeah. Um, so <laughs> it could have been a lot worse. Um, yeah. So as, as, so now as far as a professional soccer league in, in Japan goes, now you've already mentioned like teams like Yokohama, Osaka. You know, I live in Kobe. I'm a fan of. I mean, I don't really follow too much, but in a way, I do now. Um, but I'm a fan of uh, Vissel Kobe. Um, so, what what is the the professional football scene like here in Japan? For those who might not know. Well, I mean, your your, your big teams are. I mean, there's, there's the two Osaka clubs, the Cerezo and Gamba. Um, Gamba probably have the bigger support, but Cerezo recently have been doing better because Gamba were actually relegated a couple of years ago. Um, I think they oh, came really? into J1 this season. Um, they're back in the top flight now, but they did spend one season in, in J2. So, um, And then up up and up towards Tokyo. Um, the Tokyo clubs are not actually that strong. I mean, FC Tokyo are kind of mid-table. Um, I think Tokyo Verde are J2. Um, and then your big club up there is Urawa, Urawa Reds. Um, but I must say, personally, that's not a club I have a lot of time for. Um, is, is that Sendai? Uh, no, Sendai. Sendai is further north. Uh, Urawa is actually in Saitama, Ken. Oh, okay, okay. Um, so it's just north of Tokyo, but um, Urawa's Urawa's fans are. Um, are, those, are those the ones that had the controversy recently, where they had the Japanese only signs hanging yes. above the bleachers, where they were like, "No foreigners are allowed here." Yeah, and the thing is, it's not the first time with them. That that's the first time they've been caught, but they've been at it for years. Um, the um. I mean, in 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 Europe, there's a similar problem. You know, there are certain teams that attract a kind of a 
a fascist element, you know. I mean, in England, it's Chelsea uh, who attract a lot of that, and Millwall to a lesser extent. Okay. Um, in in Spain, it's Real Madrid, um, and again, Atletico Madrid as well. Where when they have players who are maybe who are not of a, uh, you know, who are minority players, they um. Well, it's it's yeah. I mean that that's one issue, but um, it's yeah, it's supporters it's not overt racism but those people aren't exactly made to feel very welcome let's put it that mm. way. um it would i mean there was never anything as on the nose as uh, you know oh japanese only you know but yeah um, so so for those of you who aren't familiar this team um out of saitama is that right yeah they, they had actually put up large signs written in english over their bleachers saying japanese only which basically I, i'm assuming meant if you're a foreigner you're not welcome in this area of the stadium yeah, it was also targeted at. I believe the team they were playing that day had a Korean striker. The team they were playing against had a Korean striker, and okay. um, it was specifically to to hurt him as well. But of course, it was a general target at all foreigners. I think, which is a shame because a lot of foreigners like myself, we love the J League, you know. Mm. And um, you know, I think I think it's it's sad that this very 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 small minority. Um, because as you know, the the, the you know ninety five percent of the people in Japan are wonderfully welcoming, warm people. Oh, absolutely. Welcome the chance to get to know foreign people and to know other cultures, but you have this less than five percent of bigots who are sadly attach themselves to clubs like Urawa. So, mm. um, and they they were penalised, weren't they, by the J League? Yeah, I believe they had to play a game behind closed doors, which yeah. cost the club about twenty five million yen. Mm. Yeah, yeah. No, no people are allowed to play. Uh, no, no, no fans are allowed to come in and watch. Yeah. Um. Yeah. Well, it's it's sad that unfortunately things like that happen in in, in many different sports, not just uh, not just soccer or football. Yeah. Um. So so um. You know, as, as far as as far as J League, that's what they refer to the professionally, the top tier league, J League here. Would you say it's a it's a, it's a good quality football? If you were uh, a European fan, if you're a fan coming from um, from you know South America, Latin America, if if you were to come here to Japan, would you enjoy watching a J League football game? Well, the thing is, I would say it, it's not it's not the most it's not the most technically accomplished football. It's not on the same level as Barcelona, Real Madrid or whatever. But it is every bit as entertaining. Okay. You'll see a lot of goals. You'll see a lot of action. You'll see a lot of energy and passion from these players because um, they're all hungry. They all want to go on and hopefully play in Europe in the future. Um, it's it's a great league to watch young talent emerging. Nice, nice. Um, and it's also a great league to just... Because the other thing about it, which I love about the J-League, is if you look at the last 10 years, over the last 10 years, there's about seven or eight different clubs have won the championship. Mm. There's it's, no it's, dynasties. It's not boring. No, I mean, as I said, in, in Scotland, it is, at the moment, it's, it's Celtic and that's it. Mm. In England, it's Manchester United, Manchester City or Chelsea or possibly Liverpool. Um, you know, you've only got those four clubs. And, um, you know, all across Europe, it's like this. You know, Holland, it's either Ajax or Feyenoord or PSV Eindhoven. You know, in Italy, it's always Inter Milan or AC Milan or um, or Roma. You know, in, um, in Spain, it's Barcelona or Real Madrid. There's these dynasties all over Europe, and that hasn't happened in Japan yet. Mm. Um, you have a good spread of eight or nine teams who are all equally capable of winning the championship at the start of the season. Nice, nice. Well, that, that that definitely makes it a much more fun and exciting thing to uh, to to watch and get into when you never really know who's who's gonna who's gonna win it, who has a absolutely. chance. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, okay, so I, I'm I'm wondering, um, would you say now? I live in Japan. You live in Japan. Um, would you say there's much excitement um, in Japan right now about the World Cup? Yeah, very much so. Um, even people who don't usually bother with football, um, the World Cup seems to ignite something in people. I think maybe it's a sense of national pride or it's a sense of, you know, everyone having a common goal. But, for example, in my school where I work, you know, um, teachers who never even talked to me before are like, oh, Liam, what do you think about the football? What do you think the score is going to be today? You know, they're, they're suddenly interested in football because the World Cup's on, you know, and it's, yeah. it's great. Um, 
I I watched the Japan game the other day with um with a friend of mine and a, and, a, and a few of his his Japanese friends and these these Japanese girls usually don't bother with football at all you know but they were like oh they all had their Japan tops on they were all singing they were all dancing they were all into it you know and it's it's something about the Japan national team specifically that seems to trigger that um and it's great it's really I wish that I wish fans in Scotland had as much passion for the Scotland team as, as Japanese do for the Japan team, you know? Yeah, it's 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 something um I know definitely I mean I the only comparison I can I can say obviously we have was in nineteen eighty six is the only time Canada's been in the World Cup. Um but when it comes to hockey, I mean Canada just stops. I mean, you know, team team Canada, damn it, that's it. It's if it's if it's uh, especially in the Olympics. Yeah. Um, but if it's like the world championships, even too, even the world juniors, every year, the world juniors, Canada stops for the world juniors. We're just like, damn, we care. Even like our under 18s. Mm. Um, but um, yeah, but I've noticed that definitely. And I mean, on um, Sunday, which was Father's Day uh, this uh, this past Sunday. Um, so it would have been Sunday morning. So June 15th, Japan time when Japan played their first game against the Ivory Coast. And mm. I was out doing Father's Day stuff with my family. And I was following the game on Twitter. And one of the interesting things was I live in downtown. Co- well, I don't live in downtown Kobe, but I live in Kobe. And we went downtown and we're in the downtown area called Sanomia. Yeah. And we get off the train and we're, we're kind of heading down towards Sanomia. And my wife looked at me and she commented, wow, there's not very many people around. <laughs> and, and it was, I mean, it was noticeably the, the streets were empty. Yeah. Um, and I said, because the soccer game's on. And she was like, what? The soccer game's on right now. Like, Japan is playing in the World Cup right now. And she was like, ah. Oh. My wife doesn't care. She's like, oh, okay, well, I don't care. But I'm like, obviously, a lot of people do. <laughs> so, yeah. and then obviously Japan lost. Um, and then later on, early in the afternoon, I saw a lot of, like, dejected-looking people. And again, a lot of those, like, young, pretty Japanese women who normally would obviously never care about sports, wearing, yeah. the, wearing their Team Japan kits with, like, little... Team Japan things, you know, paint on their face and little hearts on their face or like a little headband with the Team Japan. I saw a lot of them walking around, you know, kind of milling about. Um, so definitely a, a, a demographic that would normally never be interested in sports definitely seem to be. Yeah. And it, it's, I mean, it, it, the World Cup brings that out in everybody, but there's something particular about Japan. I mean... Yeah, I remember even last year when Japan were playing in the World Cup qualifiers before they even got to the tournament. Um, they got a draw in their final game against Australia, which meant that they qualified. Hmm. And if you in in downtown Osaka, the Doton Bori, there were people swimming naked in the river. There were like <laughs> wild parties going on, total debauchery everywhere, and it was because Japan had qualified for the World Cup. You know, it was incredible. Nice. <laughs> the Doton Bori area of Osaka <laughs> definitely has its own special, unique traditions huh yeah definitely. sports teams win people get naked jump in the in the most <laughs> disgusting polluted water that you would ever want to get into yeah. or never want to get into um yeah <laughs> well, well okay so um i'm gonna ask you liam um mm. as japan has finished uh they've they've they played one game um mm. it is now the 18th here in japan i think they're playing tomorrow yeah they're playing uh game two against greece i have a feeling I'm not going to be able to get this podcast edited together and out at that point. So those of you who are listening to episode 20 of the Just Japan podcast, even if you like download it as soon as it comes down the pipe from iTunes or Stitcher or whatever, um, this game will already be finished because um, just due to family obligations, sleep patterns and work, um, this probably won't drop until the 20th. So um, you will already know the score. Uh, or what's going to happen with the game. Um, but I am going to ask, Liam, what do you think is going to happen um, with what, – what, what do you think is going to happen with Japan this World Cup? Not just maybe tomorrow's game, but what what else? What's, go, what's going to go on? Right. Well, I firmly believe Japan will beat Greece on Friday. Okay. Um, simply because, as I said before, the only thing that brought Japan down against Ivory Coast was – the physicality of the Ivory Coast, and also the fact that I think the Japanese players were scared when Didier Drogba came on. Mm. He he came on, and within five minutes, there were two goals. Yeah. And if you watch both of the goals, at both goals, other players were getting space because there were two or three Japanese defenders dropping off to mark Drogba. 
So Drogba changed that game. Mm. Um, Greece do not have a Didier Drogba. Which, which, so, te- which team does he play for? He did play for Chelsea. I think he now plays somewhere in China. If oh. I'm, if I'm oh, oh, okay. Or possibly the Emirates. He's not playing in one of the major leagues anymore anyway. Oh, okay. Um, but um, he's still a very, very good player. Um, mm. And, uh, yeah, Greece do not have a star of that calibre. Um, okay. So Japan will not have to contend with that. I believe Japan are faster than Greece. I believe they have better individual players. I believe they are more skillful. I think they have a better team ethic, a team unit. Zaccaroni is still experimenting with the exact right makeup of the team, but I think he's going to get there. And yeah, I, I'll, I'll go for I'll go for two one to Japan. Okay, and game three. Who, what, what is the game three? I don't know who they're playing. Colombia. Colombia. Now, Colombia are, I would say, the strongest team in that group. Okay. Um, but this is where the World Cup dynamics can come into it, where it's different, right? Because Colombia won their first game already, 3-0 uh, mm. against Greece. Then they'll be playing Ivory Coast, um, I think, the day after Japan play Greece. Or possibly the day before. I'm not sure. I'll have to check that out. But it's around about the same time. And... If um, if Colombia beat Ivory Coast, they would then be on six points, which means they have already made it to round two. Okay. Right? That would leave Ivory Coast on three points. And if Japan beat Greece, as I think they will, they would also be on three points. So coming into the last game, Greece are out. It's basically a showdown between Ivory Coast and Japan as to who can put the best performance on. Mm. Now, by that point, Colombia are already on six points. They've already qualified. They've more than likely probably won the group already. Mm-hmm. So there have been cases in, in the World Cup in the past when teams who have already qualified don't take games quite so seriously as they should. Okay. Yeah. So in a sense, Japan have an advantage in that they are playing the strongest team last. Okay. So mm. Colombia may take the foot off the gas. Because I believe on their day, Colombia would beat Japan quite comfortably. Okay. But they might field a few reserve players. The players might have half an eye on round two. They might not take it too seriously, and Japan could snatch something. And then on the in the other hand, you've got Greece, who would be out by that point, playing for pride. They might just do something to Ivory Coast. Um... At the moment, I'd say it's 50-50 whether Japan will qualify for round two or not. But I've just got a feeling they, they might do it. Hmm. I think I think they'll beat Greece, and I think they'll possibly take a draw or maybe even beat Colombia. Hmm. And if they do that, and Ivory Coast fail to beat Greece, as I think they just might, then Japan go in in, in second place. And probably would play Italy in round two. Hmm. Well, well, let's keep our fingers crossed, because <laughs> I definitely want to see Japan progress past the first Absolutely. round. Absolutely, because that's just gonna make. I mean, we're both living in Japan. That's gonna make our time here even more fun. Yeah, you know, it's 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 a lot. It's a lot more fun to watch the excitement of the people. And I mean, I know how it is back home in Canada when it comes to hockey too. Obviously. Sometimes a lot of the, a lot of the people don't really care about the first round. They're like, well, but when their team progresses to the second round, all of a sudden, fair weather fans, they're everywhere. Yeah. Um. So, so Liam, you you have a podcast about soccer. Um. So, um, can you tell us a little bit about your podcast and and how people can find it? Yeah, sure. Um, we um myself and uh, three other um Celtic fans from Australia, actually. Um, Scottish Scottish expats living in Australia. Um, we we do a, a fortnightly podcast during the during the Scottish football season, which is from August until May, and it's called the Half the World Away podcast. Um, if you go to Spreaker dot com and search for Hail Hail Media, you'll find in there a list of various podcasts by Celtic fans, and they're all good. I recommend you give them all a listen. But especially look out for ours, the Half the World Away podcast. 
Um, we do a fortnightly show. Um, we do use a bit of choice language here and there. I will, I'll have to say it's maybe not suitable for the kids, but um, <laughs> we, we always have a good laugh and a good talk about Celtic and about football in general. Nice, nice. Nice. And if, if, if people out there who are listening to this podcast have any questions about football, they want to know more about Japan, football in Japan, um, you know, they want to pick your brain about anything, how can they contact you? Well, I, I'm on Twitter. Um, anybody wants to get in touch through Twitter, um, it's at uh, Liam, that's L-I-A-M 6783. Um, yeah. please, please feel free to give me a, give me a follow or, a, you know, send me a message. I'm always happy to talk football. Um, and uh, yeah, you know, um, I'm also on Facebook, uh, Liam Carrigan. Please feel free to look me up. Um, nice. And uh, yeah, I'm always happy to, to talk football. And um, I think that from my experience, football is not just a sport. Football is something that can really change lives, you know. Mm. Um, I'll, I'll share with you a little, a little quote. Um, sure. There was a great footballer about 20 years ago by the name of Eric Cantona. Ah. Who played yeah, oh yeah 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 Eric Cantona yeah um I'm I'm sorry that wow ha, ha, yeah I just yeah. I listened to um uh Kevin Smith Smodcast mm. um he did a whole show about him recently wow where, where I first That's... was introduced to him I was like holy crap yeah <laughs> you know uh, I don't know if you're familiar with Smodcast Kevin Smith Scott yeah. Mosher the yeah they did a whole basically Eric Cantona episode. All right. Yeah, yeah. Where someone sent him a couple of videos about Eric Cantona, and he just like fell in love with him, yeah. and his quotes and the way he talked, yeah. and his videos. It was amazing. Okay, but sorry. I'm... So, um, Cantona was talking about um, you've seen how some football players, um, some football players don't like to be mobbed by the fans, and they they don't they don't feel comfortable signing autographs, and sometimes it can be a bit standoffish. Um, in fact, I'll, I'll name and shame here. Robbie Keane, the Ireland international, is one of the most ignorant men I've ever met in my life. The way he treated some fans who asked for his autograph was frankly disgraceful. But anyway, Cantona, um, he, um, he gave a famous quote. He said, um, he said, for Eric Cantona, it's 10 seconds. But for that child or that individual, it could be the greatest moment of their life. Mm. And I think that that's beautiful. That just sums up the... The respect that football fans have for their idols mm -hmm. and it also sums up what a great man Eric Cantona is that he realizes the impact he can have on people's lives just by saying hello to them or signing a bit of paper for them you know mm. um, it really is um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a beautiful thought yeah that is that is wow amazing yeah, that's so true yeah um, oh, awesome awesome what a great way to end it good sir um, so for all of you out there who who stayed into tune into who who tuned into episode twenty of the Just Japan podcast, World Cup in Japan or not World Cup in Japan, Japan and the World Cup, the World Cup was here, but that was uh, several years ago. Um, thank you for listening, and uh, that's it for the interview portion of the show. That was a really awesome interview, and I hope you enjoyed it. I'm talking to Liam about uh, soccer, the World Cup, soccer in Japan, and all of that stuff. And uh, remember, um, all of the links to contact Liam, if you so choose to do so, are in the show notes at BusanKevin.com. Now, again, all the other links I've talked about are there as well. Um, you can find the links to subscribe on iTunes, uh, Stitcher Radio, also um, all the links to the RSS feed for the show. Um, you can even, I'll put a link so you can download this file directly, or just listen and the, uh, the web player uh, and the web browser itself. All those links are at BusanKevin.com uh, in the show notes under episode 20, Japan and the World Cup. So please go over there, check out the show notes. Very important. Also, if you ever have any questions, you can, of course, contact me uh, on Twitter at JLandKev, J-L-A-N-D-Kev, K-E-V, at JLandKev. Uh, that's the Just Japan podcast Twitter feed. And uh, send me a question there anytime, and I will get back to you. Also, you can, <clears throat> of course, go over and like the Just Japan podcast and Boost on Kevin Facebook page. That link is also in the show notes. And you can always email me at boostonkevin at gmail.com. Boostonkevin at gmail.com. And for those of you wondering, Busan, the word Busan, that is a city name. That is the second largest city in South Korea. And that's where I lived many, many years ago when I first kind of started developing my online presence okay so 
Um, I've had that name for quite a long time. It's kind of turned into a bit of a brand, and it stuck. Um, <clears throat> um, I, here's a question. What do you think, guys? Um, I've, I've been tossing around the idea of actually opening up a Busan Kevin um, a Busan, not a, sorry, not a Busan Kevin, a Just Japan podcast specific, uh, page, uh, Facebook page, and, uh, what do you think, guys? Let me know. Is, is that worth a go, or should I just continue on with the page I already have? Um, uh, send me a message at busankevin at gmail.com, or send me a tweet. Uh, let me know. Um, yeah, so there you go. So, guys, thank you for listening to, the, uh, episode 20 of the Just Japan podcast. Um, of course, it's always a lot of fun to do this show. I always appreciate it. I appreciate all the great feedback I'm getting. Every week, more and more people are listening to the show, and that definitely makes me happy. Hey, if you have any ideas, um, if there's anything that you would like me, any topics you would like me to tackle in the Just Japan podcast, um, please, again, send a, send an email to uh, me at boostonkevin at gmail.com. And I did get one very interesting very interesting comment, which I, I never even thought about. And it's it's very true, and it's something I'm definitely going to try to rectify. But um, one, one listener mentioned, hey, how come you don't interview women? And I thought to myself, wow, you're right. 20 episodes so far, and I have not interviewed a woman. So that's something I need to rectify. Um, yeah, um, good point, good point. Um, I've met uh, many amazing women here in Japan who are doing very cool things, very interesting things, a lot of dynamic people with dynamic stories, various varying stories, and uh, definitely um, I need to get their voice here on the Just Japan podcast as well. I guess I guess what it just comes down to, I, I tend to know more men than women. I think that's what's going on. But, uh, but yeah, good point. Definitely going to try to rectify that situation in the future. All right, guys, so thank you. My name's Kevin. I am the host of the Just Japan podcast. And I want to thank you all for taking the time to to listen today, tonight, um, and wherever you are. I hope you're happy and healthy, and take care.